Good morning. My name is Hamdi Rafai, and thank you all for welcoming, for coming and uh, signing in today on the Zoom conference. I want to thank our participants, Mustafa Aksu and Joanne Lin. Joanne is with Amnesty International, and Mustafa is with the Uyghur, Uyghur Human Rights Project. Thank you for, both for agreeing to participate today and providing us with your thoughtful insight. Thank you to uh, all of the viewers and, of course, our host, the National Interest Foundation. Before we start, I just want to take a moment to remember uh, what's going on today in Israel and Palestine. Uh, the violence is obviously in a great deal of upheaval, and I just want us all to remember the victims of what's going on, uh, the forgotten Palestinians, and of course, Israelis unsettled. Uh, many Palestinians have died today, and we really should always keep them in our memories and thoughts as we move forward, uh, particularly as we sit in safety in our offices and homes. So. I'm going to start today by asking Joanne to just give us a uh, introduction of Amnesty's efforts and what Amnesty is doing. Uh, I'm going to ask that uh, the panelists limit their initial introductions to just a few minutes, if you could. Uh, we're going to be on for an hour and a half. And we're going to start with some initial introductions. Then we'll do some discussion between myself and the panelists. And of course, the panelists will have an opportunity to present information that they want us to be aware of. And then we will take questions uh, from the uh, viewers. So Joanne, with that, I welcome you to our Zoom conference today and ask that uh, you please uh, give us your thoughts about the Uyghur, uh, crime, the crimes against the Uyghur community. Thank you, Hamdi, for that warm introduction and for um, the opportunity to, to speak on this National Interest Foundation panel. Uh, before I can launch in, I just want to clarify, you just want me to describe what Amnesty is doing right now. Oh, you no, you can, you can provide whatever comments okay. you want. It's just I wanted to make sure that we didn't take too much of the viewers' time with initial comments, uh, because I think uh, maybe at one point we had sent some information that the, the initial introduction or comments by you should be 10 or 12 minutes, and usually that doesn't actually work out so well. So if we can limit it to just a few minutes, I would appreciate that. Okay, well, I have plenty to share and say, including two videos that I hope to show today, uh, but I'll wait to show them um, later in the presentation. Um, I'll just start off by saying, you know, today's um, panel is vitally important. And um, while my co-panelist is really the expert on the situation in Xinjiang, I want to highlight in particular the nightmarish situation that Uyghur families are facing, particularly children separated by their parents and uh, from their parents. And by way of background, for decades, Chinese authorities have systematically persecuted Uyghurs and other Turkic Muslims living in the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. And since 2014, Chinese authorities have greatly expanded the police presence in Xinjiang under a blanket of surveillance as part of China's declared people's war on terror and efforts to combat religious extremism. Since 2017, an estimated 1 million Uyghurs, Kazakhs, and other predominantly Muslim peoples have been arbitrarily detained in Xinjiang, where they've been subjected to torture, ill treatment, political indoctrination, and forced cultural assimilation. This mass detention campaign, combined with systematic repression, has created a nightmarish situation of prolonged family separation, where Uyghur children in Xinjiang have been separated from their parents who are working or studying outside of China. China's mass detention campaign has made it impossible for Uyghur parents to return to China to fetch their children. And for many Uyghur parents, what was intended to be a brief time of overseas work or study has slowly and inexorably turned into exile and family separation. Many Uyghur children in Xinjiang have been left in the care of their extended family. Not surprisingly, some relatives who have been looking after the children have now been jailed themselves and taken to prison camps. Many exiled Uyghurs have been completely cut off from their children, some as young as five years old. And Uyghur children are not allowed to leave China at the same time, their parents will face persecution and imprisonment if they return to China. 
So that's a preview of what I hope to address during today's panel. I'll turn it back. Thank you. We're, you know, using their, their kind of jingoistic term of uh, re-education camps when they're really just prisons or concentration camps. So I, I'd like to see and talk about who are the Uyghurs, because even though our audience today is quite educated, very cosmopolitan, I'm sure they know, there are going to be a lot of people who see this on YouTube or elsewhere later who aren't familiar with who the Uyghurs are and have never even heard the term. I ran across this as a Syrian. They thought they didn't know Syria was a country, you know, and they certainly have probably never heard of who the Uyghurs are. Most of them, who are the Uyghurs? How many are in the United States? How many are in China? What is Xinjiang? Is it an autonomous region? Is it a county? Tell us a little bit about the Uyghurs, Mustafa, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. Uh, first, uh, Uyghurs, as I said, uh, they are Turkic people. Most of them are, majority of them are Sunni Muslims. And they have been living in, uh, in East Turkestan or Xinjiang in, from the ancient time. And we Uyghurs regard ourselves the owners of this land. Um, after being occupied by the Chinese Communist Party in 1949, um, Xinjiang, uh, so, uh, Xinjiang became autonomous region in 1956. And so the full name is Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. Um, according to the Chinese Statistical Yearbook of 2018, there are approximately 12 million Uyghurs. But we don't really believe in that figure because we Uyghurs have, uh, we, be, we strongly believe that Chinese government has the tendency to Underrepresent the my uh, we, uh, Turkey groups like Uyghurs, Kazakhs, and Kyrgyz. So um, there are different statistics about how many people, how many Uyghurs are in the world. Like some Uyghurs say that oh, there are more than 20 million, and some claim that there are maybe 35. As I said, we don't really have statistics about it. But so that's why we are just. I'm most of my, in my presentation. I stick to the Chinese sources because it's on, on one of the only official source. And Xinjiang is autonomous region, yes, but it is autonomous region in quotation. Uh, Uyghurs don't really get to enjoy their really uh, the autonomous rights there. Uh, Chinese government have been uh, transferring hundred millions of people, and Chinese migrants into the region and making the uh, Uyghur region less Uyghur or not Uyghur at all. Thank you, Mustafa. Why is China criminalizing being a Uyghur. Why are they trying to ethnic cleanse the Uyghurs? I mean, let's just call it what it is. And it's a genocide. And if we look at the United Nations legal definition of genocide or ethnic cleansing, that is what's occurring to the Uyghurs. Why are they doing this, Mustafa? Um, very good question. And in 2014, China's head of state, President Xi Jinping launched the people's war and terror in Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, making uh, the areas where Uyghurs constitute nearly 90% of the population the front line. So high level officials follow up, follow up with the orders to round up everyone who should be rounded up and wipe them completely or destroy them, uh, destroy their roots and branch or break their lineage, break their roots, uh, break their connections and break their origins. So, uh, so officials describe Uyghurs with dehumanizing terms and repeatedly link them with a mass internment of the Uyghurs too. But most of I don't mean I don't mean to interrupt you, but th this is this is a very important question. The the Uyghurs are a religious minority in China, but they're a substantial number, and I and I and many people don't understand or appreciate why the Uyghurs are being targeted. Is it because they're Muslim? Is it because they're of ethnic Turk? ancestry or heritage? What is the reason? Is it because of the geography of oh. where it is? That's, I think yeah, that's important for people to understand. First of all, yeah, Uyghurs are very distinct. They are Turkic speaking people and they're Muslims. So it's, they are being oppressed because of ethno-religious identity. At the same time, uh, we, uh, like because of the region, and I'm, I'm sure maybe some of you have heard Belt and Road Initiative, so yes. Xinjiang is gateway to the Central Asia and to Europe, and Chinese. But it has been there has been like you know uprisings and ethnic clashes in the last ten years and twenty years. 
So Chinese government wants to keep this region very stable so that they can fulfill their Belt and Road Initiative very smoothly. However, that's why one of the reasons suddenly policy change, the Xinjiang policy change and the government and, and also uh, as we learned according to the leaked document um, by uh, gained by New York Times and others, President Xi see the religion uh, as disease, not only Muslims, right? But we can see that their persecution against the Christians and Catholics in China and also Tibetans. Uh, that's why uh, I believe um, when Chinese government uh, is trying to, uh, trying ethnic cleansing uh, against the Uyghur people. Why, why is the Belt and Road Initiative so important to China? And why should the US be so concerned that China not succeed in the Belt and Road Initiative as well as the rest of the world? Well, uh, in my opinion, um, it was China because uh, China wants to um, dominate the whole uh, world. That's the China's dream and Chinese government's dream. And we are seeing that uh, their soft power is really strong. And we are seeing that countries in, like, in Central Asia and the Middle Eastern countries are now like they have very strong economic ties. And that's one of the reasons why they are not really speaking about we were a genocide. And the world should be really concerned about the China's uh, action because uh, the, the current government, the Chinese Communist uh, Party, is they, they are very um, ambitious and, and, and they, are, like, they, they want to be the leader of the world. Um, but as we know, Chinese government is not democratic government at all. And I think it will be a nightmare one day if Chinese government takes the lead and become a leader of the world. So the U.S. government should be really concerned about that. Jo Joanne, let me let me ask you. In in China has clearly been involved in Africa. China has tried to make inroads in the Middle East. Everywhere we see, and this Belt and Road Initiative is apparently very important to them. And there is no question that China is a superpower asserting itself in the seas and by land, expanding worldwide. How can the United States or the world handle the requests of Amnesty International to deal with these human rights violations when China has positioned itself in such a geopolitically strong position worldwide that most are intimidated? We see even Pakistan, a Muslim country, uh, turns a blind eye and makes excuses for China calling just basic citizens of, of Uyghur, Uyghur heritage Terrorists, how can the world stand up? How can Am Amnesty International be successful in making this human rights issue prominent or something that people want to address? So Hamdi, I promise I will answer your question, but I wanna make sure that we don't lose your question from earlier in the uh, panel about who are the Uyghurs, because I actually think that's critically important. If you don't mind, I wanna share a video that documents one of the cases that Amnesty International is campaigning on behalf of. I hope this works. Um, can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear that? We, we can hear it, it's, it's perfectly visible and I can hear it, thank you. Maybe you can raise the volume a bit. Kocanız sadece Uygur olduğu için tutuklandı. Çinli yetkililerine sesleyin. Kocamı serbest bıraktılar. Kocam bir baba, bir eş. Onunla çok ihtiyacımız var. Kavuşmanız için her türlü destek verin. Thank you, Joanne, for that video. You're welcome. And that gives you a glimpse of what Amnesty is trying to do on this front. Um, and um, excuse me. Joanne, let me, let me ask you this. Let's skip the geopolitics for a moment and focus on what you said about who are the Uyghurs. I look at Mustafa and he looks like my next door neighbor. He sounds like my next door neighbor or my work colleague or somebody I might've gone to college with. I'm of Syrian ethnic heritage. I don't know that people would identify me so readily. 
how do we humanize the Uyghur people that Americans and Europeans and Middle Easterners and everybody in the world understands their plight and sees them as one of their own, oftentimes they just mix in or it's just a number that we're talking about. How do we make this real to everybody? Well, we make this real through events like today where you actually are hearing from Mustafa who is not talking about things in the abstract. He's telling you his personal experiences, his family's experiences and his friends' experiences. And we know that the, the, the horrors that he's shared are not limited to a few, but ex unfortunately they extend to an estimated 1 million people who have been detained in these mass concentration camps. We know that the Chinese government and authorities have engaged in systemic, systemic repression, which includes forced sterilizations, coerced abortions, uh, rape, torture, and other forms of bodily and mental health harm. And part of the way uh, Amnesty International does this work is because we are a global movement, we have a presence in many parts of the world. We don't actually have a physical presence inside Xinjiang or China because Chinese authorities do not allow for human rights advocates and activists and civil society to operate in that country. But importantly, Amnesty International has interviewed Uyghur families living in Australia, Canada, Italy, the Netherlands, and Turkey. And although these families are scattered all over the world, they have told us stories that are surprisingly uniform about how they've been forcibly separated from their children, how they live in anguish, seeing their children trapped in China and how they're desperately yearning for reunification. They cannot and often do not feel like they can publicly speak out about these human rights abuses due to the fear of repercussions for their children and relatives in China. And in spite of these challenges, there still are very courageous Uyghurs around the world, including in the United States, who have chosen to publicly share their stories. And so we need to listen to these stories. Um, I have one more story that I would like to share. Joanne, before you get to that, I, I, wanna, I wanna follow up on what you just said. I, I'm gonna give you a chance to tell about this other story, but I mean, you, you make it seem very simple that people will understand this, but there's so much misinformation out there. We live in an age of misinformation. Oftentimes people can't tell the difference between the real and the fake. For all I know, Mustafa is a digital recreation that we've put up here on the screen for everybody to see. Nobody can feel, touch him, see him. And frankly, people choose to disbelieve without facts. How, how does, I mean, I, I've noticed that there's a lot of knee jerk reactions that we're seeing to the Uyghur, to, to the ethnic cleansing of the Uyghurs. For example, here in Washington DC, there seems to have become an industry of misinformation to counter the story of the Uyghurs. I don't know whether it's funded by the Chinese government or elsewhere, but we see often uh, publications like uh, Gray Zone or Max Blumenthal actually embrace and promote and write stories that the Uyghurs are not being ethnically cleansed and none of this is happening. And I mean, well, frankly, a lot of it appears to be just completely made up to me of what they're writing, but how are people supposed to know better? I mean, I've actually seen these stories republished and talked about by people that are recognized in the world of academia, recognized journalists, People like Joshua Landis actually picked up on Max Blumenthal's writings about the Uyghurs and started promoting it. Now we have Syrians running around in disbelief as to who the Uyghurs are and what's happening to them because supposed academic and so-called expert Joshua Landis has decided to cast doubt on it. How, how do we overcome that? Well, I actually think that the treatment of the Uyghurs is an area where there is much more common view uh, agreement that the atrocities being committed in Xinjiang amount to crimes against humanity. I mean, it's not every day that uh, President Biden's Secretary of State Blinken and former President Trump's Secretary of State Mike, Pompe Mike Pompeo both 
um, agreed that the Chinese government's treatment of Uyghurs is um, tantamount to an effort to commit genocide. And so I think we here in the United States, we have the benefit of a very, very free society where people have access to information, different sources, different points of information. Um, people can express themselves without being uh, afraid of being arrested or detained, which is not the situation in China. So it's just incumbent on all your viewers and all your readers to do their homework and to educate themselves. And I think you will see that the overwhelming amount of information, whether it's documentation by human rights groups, by journalists um, and others, is that the Chinese government is engaged in a mass campaign to repress and as you say, ethnically cleanse the Uyghurs. Would you mind sharing your video, Joanne? Can we see this other case? I would be happy to share this. This is a, a video of a family, a Uyghur family that has been forcibly separated due to the Chinese government's policies. The Uyghur parents and their youngest children have, are in Italy and four of their other children have remained in Xinjiang and in China. And the parents to great peril came out of the woodwork to share their story with Amnesty. And here is a short video of their story. You can give me a thumbs up if you can see and hear that. We can see it in here just fine. Thank you, Joanne. Biz şu aşağı mevcutum burun kahçlarını ki balığa tehdit kılıp işte atanalarını kürsüle diğerlik bir tehditlerini kabrın aldı. Andı bu balığını. Joanne, could you increase the volume just a little bit? Thank you. Thank you. Ula Kashka or Grum, it Paha of Tuda, Uyazel Kamil Kuzumniki, a real Kuznash, Nimsigat, Chigi Yet Nigelikton, Ula Uzaldra or Plumbet, Citroen, Shnobla, Pasplan, Yardamar Club, Uyad or Plumbet, Citroen. Bolla <gülüyor> Ich <gülüyor>
balırımızda bir bir minut mu hatta bir sekund mu yardımcınız çıkar koyunuz hiç kanala. Daim şu balırımızda e, dua kılımız, namaz dua kılıp ibadet kıl, açtak etler kılımız. Biz bu yer diğerse balırımızda bu balırımız var etmiyor ki yok. Bu balın hiç kanda günah yok, hiç kanda günah bu balla. Anam bile, dadam bile, cem bile, anam bile, dadam bayar yaşayma. Bir gün bir gün ayş yok. Thank you for sharing that, Joanne. I I I understand exactly what we're seeing there. My father spent his life isolated from his extended family, and now I spend my life isolated and separated and isolated from my extended family. So people, I think many people can relate to the to the crimes being committed against the Uyghurs. Uh, Mustafa, let me ask you this. How, how can Americans relate to this locally? What is happening here in the US? Is America involved in supporting what's happening to, to the Uyghurs or are we opposing it? Exactly what is happening here? Uh, here in, in the United States, uh, we, uh, we know that U.S. Uh, sanctioned uh, on some uh, people, for example, uh, uh, like uh, U.S. announced that the first uh, coordinated human rights sanctions on perpetrators against the two People's Republic of Chinese officials responsible for the gross human rights violation. And the sanction was on. There, there are two pieces of legislation, Mustafa, that the, is being considered right now. Yeah, and I was going. To Maybe you could tell us about that. those. So currently, there are two pending um, based, um, a bill. One is called uh, Uyghur Human Rights Protection Act. It is HR six one six three zero, and another one is Uyghur Human Rights uh, Uyghur Forced Labor um, Prevention Act. Um, like what Americans can do is like they sh they can contact their senators and the congressmen to ask them to co-sponsor the uh, the bill. Um, we are quite hopeful that the bill will be passed um, by Congress and the Senate, but it's just a matter of time. And I think we need more uh, senators and congressmen uh, to to uh, to favor uh, the two bills, the pending bills. What, Mustafa, are, are American companies having goods manufactured in these concentration camps or by Uyghur forced labor? Yeah, it's one of the, um, um, how should I put it? Um, yeah, it's, it's just a really, forced labor is a really horror. And, and recently a new report came out um, just on this massive program for the, uh, to force Uyghurs to be picked cotton. Um, in in 2019 2018 and there are thousands and thousands of Uyghurs were uh, forced to leave their hometown and to work in the uh, cotton field uh, the number of the forced workers is massive um, one Chinese um, government media report I think it's Xinhua news agency said that in the first half of 2018 uh, more than 60,000 workers were transferred to new places. And in fact, uh, I believe the true numbers are much bit higher. And, and also in last year in February, uh, the media un uncovered a factory making Nike sport shoes using Uyghur workers uh, in a city in the Northern China. And the, in to, yesterday, I think the day before, there's another report that Apple actually used thousands of Uyghur uh, slave labor. Um, so, so many companies and, and many, uh, nearly every clothing company uh, is complicit in the Uyghur forced labor. And we have been campaigning uh, for the you know, US government to impose a blanket ban on imports from, from Xinjiang. And, um, and December, last year, uh, December 2nd, uh, oh, before um, the US government finally impose a ban or all on cotton products um, from the Xinjiang Production and Construction Corps. And it is a military style force with a huge global business footprint and it produced 30% of the Xinjiang's cotton. And for, the, for so those of you who don't know, um, 
every 84% uh, uh, of China's cotton is grown in my homeland. Um, so that means um, at least one in five gov garments, uh, cotton garments worldwide is probably uh, made with Uyghur slave labor. Mustafa, I'm, I'm wearing a suit and it's a beautiful suit. I don't, I didn't, it wasn't made in China, thankfully, I just checked, but I'm sure a lot of Americans are running around wearing clothes made in China. How can they feel confident that it wasn't made by forced slave labor? It sounds like there's a good likelihood it was. And should Americans stop buying clothing made in China? Yeah, I know it's very hard not, you know, most of the government, if you, if you go to, you know, famous, uh, the brands, the shops here, it's always made in China. And sometimes, of course, we can find made in Bangladesh or India or other place. But so I think what we can do as a consumer, I think you know, what Americans can do, write to the company and ask if they are complicit in Uyghur forced labor or ask them to investigate and do, to do some due diligence work. Of course, it's very hard to do it because um, China, Chinese government in the factories are never transparent about that. Uh, that's what they can do. I mean, it's very hard. I know that not to buy <laughs> made in China products these days, but at least what you can do is to be aware of this uh, Uyghur slave labor uh, issues and contact your brand, write them, and to ask them if they have any connections, ask them to cut their relationship uh, with uh, uh, the supply chain with China. Is, is the geography partly to blame here? I mean, you know, we talked about this Belt and Road project and it seems like the Uyghurs are almost a victim to their territory and that China is victimizing them because of that. Uh, you know, I, I can't help but wonder, maybe we should be looking at the geography because, you know, I mean, I glossed over the geopolitics of it earlier, but how can we avoid that if that's really what's causing China's uh, ethnic cleansing of the Uyghurs. E either one of you, you can, you know, just jump in, and I don't, I don't expect you know everything about the geopolitics of it and the geography of it. But both of you displayed a map, and that map must have been awfully important in your minds that both of you had them in. Most of you had it in your PowerPoint presentation. In Joanne, it was in your video. So the the geography seems to be awfully important here. Tell me, what, you know, what role is this playing in this? So um, I want to make clear that the Chinese government's repression of Uyghurs goes back decades and predates um, any current investment initiatives. And so there has been long established animus um, by the Chinese government against Turkic Muslims in Xinjiang and elsewhere in China. So, so you don't think that it's the Belt and Road Initiative that's causing this? You think it's more the history of communism in China or a, a uh, religious animosity or animosity against religion generally? Would I don't think fair? there's I don't think there's any singular cause. And I think that's true when you're talking about discrimination against any peoples. But I, I think it's important to understand the historical and cultural context that this is not a recent phenomenon in China. Now, what is more recent is this a campaign that has been waged by Chinese government authorities starting in 2014 and then intensifying in 2017 in terms of the roundups, the mass arrest, the mass detention, the, uh, uh, the political indoctr indoctrination. So that has really kind of reached a fever pitch since 2017. And what, what caused this new policy that started in 2014? I think that's what, because I mean, clearly we've seen that there have been ethnic rivalries or religious rivalries or tensions uh, between communities before. And to not minimize the, the way the Uyghurs are treated before 2014, certainly after 2014, it, we can't characterize it as any other way but criminal. So why did it change in 2014? I don't think answer. I don't think either Mustafa or I can speak for the Chinese government as to why they decided to wage this um, anti-human rights campaign. But I think it's important in terms of looking at the moment that we're in now, in 2021, here in the United States. What are the opportunities for, for pressuring the Chinese authorities to halt these atrocities? And as you've already mentioned, as Mustafa was speaking to uh, about this. 
you know, there are several major apparel companies, both in the United States and the UK, that have faced backlash from their customers, investors, and elsewhere for allegedly sourcing materials like cotton from Xinjiang. Um, Secretary of State Blinken has called on all governments around the world, including the United States, to take concrete action to ensure that no companies are providing China with products or services that facilitate the repression of Uyghurs. So I think there is a tremendous opportunity here. Um, I wanted to also share what um, Amnesty International is asking um, uh, the US government to focus on with respect to the family separation issues that I spoke to. And here are some actions that the US government can do, take. First, they can ensure that all Uyghurs and Turkic Muslims who are residing in the United States, that they are provided with assistance to establish contact with their children in China. And this must be the case for any Uyghurs here, even if they don't have lawful immigration status. One of the common complaints we heard from Uyghurs um, who had relocated to Europe, Australia, Turkey, and elsewhere is that sometimes those host countries um, governments would decline or refuse to assist them because they said you are not actually here lawfully or you're not a permanent resident of our country. So we're urging the US government to provide all assistance to Uyghurs here in the United States. Secondly, the US government, Congress should provide humanitarian pathways for those Uyghurs and Turkic Muslims who are here. And that includes access to a fair and effective asylum process, legal counsel in immigration proceedings, a thorough assessment of possible human rights violations or abuses if they were to be returned to Xinjiang, and then the ability to ch challenge any deportation or removal orders. And then finally, with respect to what, can, what else can the US do to pressure China to halt these crimes, she, uh, Mustafa already mentioned some of the bills that are under consideration in Congress, but even separate of legislation, the Biden administration right now can um, undertake these actions, um, including funding and supporting human rights NGOs that support human rights defenders, that are engaged in prison visits, legal representation, provision of visas, and trial monitoring in China. Um, the US government should call for a UN fact-finding mission to Xinjiang in order to hold accountable Chinese government officials who are responsible for such abuses. Um, the US should ban surveillance exports to China that pose a substantial risk of being used to violate people's human rights. And then finally, the US government, the Biden administration should aggressively push for international human rights norms vis-a-vis -vis China in all fora, bilateral, regional, and multilateral fora using all diplomatic and economic tools at their disposal. Thank you, Joanne. I, I appreciate your telling us what Amnesty is planning. I, I have to express a little bit of cynicism though, because during the Trump administration over a period of four years, all that we kept hearing was a lot of, and I'm gonna just come out and say it, propaganda about sanctuary cities. And in America, sanctuary cities have a long history of providing a, a protection for people that are not in status in the United States that are victims of crime so that they can reach out to the, to the police, to legal authorities without fear of being deported or somehow mistreated. Over the past four years, people have heard nothing about but uh, bad things about sanctuary cities as though, it, as, a, as though it was a bad thing. When in fact, we all know that sanctuary cities really prevents uh, people who are not in status from being victimized. Uh, so I, I hope that people understand it and that maybe some Uyghurs in the United States that are not in status might be, might view this and understand that they're not uh, subject to any kind of arrest just because they seek help from the United States government. Uh, ha having said that about the sanctuary cities, I, I do want to ask you, what is Amnesty International or the Uyghur Human Rights Project doing in relation to the United Nations? And is the United Nations doing anything to help? The, the Uyghur population. Uh, you know, as far as Syria, we we felt that, you know, maybe it appeared like they were helping us, but oftentimes they were hurting us and even subsidizing Assad with aid that only went to Assad and not to refugees or people displaced internally 
or externally that were victims of Mossad. So I wonder how well, how does the UN approaching the Uyghur, the Uyghur crisis or the Uyghur ethnic cleansing, uh, especially with with China sitting in the UN in such a powerful position? Either one of you can just chime in. Whatever whoever wants to answer that. Well, so definitely China, by virtue of China being one of the permanent countries on, you know, the UN Security Council and having veto authority, that does make um, any UN efforts challenging, but it doesn't foreclose, it doesn't close the door permanently. And um, I think that it's going to be critical for the UN to be very, very clear in condemning um, all the human rights abuses taking place in Xinjiang. There is growing international consensus on that. And as I just mentioned, you know, we are calling for a UN fact-finding mission to Xinjiang, which would require Chinese, the Chinese government to allow access and to, and to cooperate. And I think it's gonna be incumbent upon the UN to, to remind China you know, that they have ratified the International Convention of the Child, um, which has very clear human rights obligations with respect to family separation and ensuring that children and their parents are reunited immediately. And so there are, um, there are tools at the disposal of the UN, and it clearly will require the pressure of every single member state of the UN, including the United States. Since, since China it has ratified that convention, why is it that uh, no effort has been made to criminally prosecute uh, China for what it's doing in these concentration camps, separating families, uh, engaging in, in, well, I mean, we've, discussed it, but why, why hasn't any effort been made to prosecute criminally? I actually don't know. I don't, I don't know if that's the case. I don't know if that's if there are international authorities that are investigating this. I think that the key here is that it's not one or two or even a handful of individuals. This is the Chinese government's national policy. So this is coming from the very top, from President Xi Jinping down, and it's being orchestrated and implemented across the country. As I showed you in the video of those four Uyghur teenagers who fled Xinjiang in, and went to Shanghai and then to Beijing in search of help, they were arrested by Chinese police in, 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 outside of Xinjiang. And so this is clearly um, you know, the product of a very uh, coordinated systematic a national policy. I do think the UN and its other for, its other UN bodies should bring all pressure to bear on keeping the spotlight on China. China does not like the attention and the criticism, but I think it's going to be critical that if China really does want to live up and fulfill its um, stated aspirations to become, you know, a or if not the world leader then that does require abiding by human rights standards and international norms. You know, it's, it's, it's upsetting to see that Russia protected Assad from any accountability for his war crimes in Syria. Oftentimes we in the US, we protect Israel for anything it's done. And now we see that China is protecting itself. It seems like the Security Council veto has become you know, a, a, a tool for human rights, to protect human rights violators more than anything. And I, and I think that yet again, we're seeing that with the, with the Uyghur population. Um, uh, just, let, let me- uh, In speaking, speaking of uh, United Nations, um, in March this year, 16 United Nations experts expressed their serious concerns about 150 companies connected to detention and forced labor of Uyghurs. And the last year in June, uh, 50, 50 United Nations Special Rapporteur and Human Rights Council independent experts, they uh, wrote a joint statement and also a joint letter from 39 countries was submitted to United Nations Human Rights Council in October, October last year. Well, we're, we're in the last uh, remaining half hour of the discussion. And so I'd like to take questions from the audience. Um, if I can just figure out how to get to those questions. I'm actually pretty tech savvy. Um, let's see here. So if you just give me a moment.
can people just unmute themselves and ask the questions? I uh, know that's not how we do it. There's a chat where they can post their questions. Um, and I'm not sure I'm accessing those correctly. Just one moment, please. I want to just uh, put a reminder that if anyone has any questions, uh, they can write it to the chat and that way we will be able to see it. I don't control who's muted or who's not, so I don't. If, so Hamdi, if you're having, if, uh, if you have any trouble pulling it up there, we can just, we can just uh, unmute. Uh, anybody who would like to, to ask a question because we have the admin controls to. to I think that you're going to have to unmute everybody because well, how are you going to know they have a question? Yeah, what we can do is anybody who has a question can just, um, you know, if you haven't, if you can't pull up yours, not a big deal. They can just send a, a, a group chat uh, if they have a question, we can unmute them, like in, you know, in subsequent order if they have a question too. Okay, thank you, Basam. So sure. if, you, if you send a message to the chat that you'd like to be unmuted, then uh, Bassam or Imran, uh, both who are here at the National Interest Foundation, uh, will unmute you so that you can ask your question. I would just ask that questions be questions and not statements. If you do want to make a statement, I understand we're all anxious to provide input, that you make it a brief uh, statement. Um, I see that there is a question that's been asked via the chat. Uh, it says here, how similar is the situation faced by Uyghurs to that faced by Tibetans? Uh, and he, I guess he's asking you to compare contrast so that he can understand what the Uyghurs are facing. Um, is, there, is there any similarity or dissimilarity, uh, either one of you, to the situation faced by Tibetans? Well, actually, there are a lot of similarities right um just to give a context the chen chuang who used to be the party secretary of tibet autonomous region was assigned to the position as a party secretary of xinjiang autonomous region in august 2016. so he's one of the main architects of this concentration camps so he almost applied all the security measures what he used to do in tibet so for example, confiscating the passports and and the recruiting large number of police and building a surveillance system, also building a, a police checkpoints every hundred meter or every two hundred meter in all over Xinjiang. They are look very similar. Um, I'm not a Tibetan expert, uh, but um, so I can't really tell what how different they are. I mean, the nature of this uh, oppression is almost the same, but the only difference now probably the Uyghurs are, um, I'm not in position of saying that, but uh, as a person to represent myself, it's my own idea, uh, uh, opinion that I think Uyghurs are really being oppressed uh, than how Tibet, and I, I mean like what Uyghurs are going through as far, um, uh, harsher than what Tibetans are going through at the moment. I, certainly it's important that all victims of human rights be acknowledged and that any uh, situation, whether it be in Tibet or, or to the Uyghurs or elsewhere is, is respected. Uh, people's rights are important. Joanne, uh, can you compare and contrast in any way the situation between the Uyghurs and Tibet? Does Amnesty International have a position? Yeah, we don't. We Africa don't Tibetan. rank. We, we don't compare. Um, I but I understand where this question is coming from. Um, the the sad truth is there are many many groups and minorities who are um, abused and repressed by Chinese authorities. Tibetans long have been. Um, you know, Amnesty International has been focusing our efforts in recent years um, more directly on Xinjiang as well as what's been happening in Hong Kong. But the situation in Tibet has been long standing. And as Mustafa mentioned, the forms of extreme discrimination, the restrictions of freedom of expression um, in Tibet are very similar to what we are seeing in Xinjiang. And I see here that the uh...
I'd like to hear from the panelists. We have a question here about how the economic factors play a role in the differing responses from countries to the Uyghur crisis. For example, why have the US and the UK been stronger in their condemnation than the governments in some Middle Eastern or Muslim countries? Uh, and I think that's probably making reference to Pakistan, which has been you know, quite an obvious uh, uh, issue there. Uh, and again, either one of you can answer that question. Why have the United States and UK been much stronger in their condemnation than countries that you would expect would be strong in their condemnation, like a Muslim country like Pakistan or any Middle Eastern or any country in the Middle East? Well, I'm not an expert and I cannot speak for any um, Middle Eastern or Muslim country. And as, as we all know, right, there are always many, many factors at play. Human rights is, is one variable, but often it's not the only variable and it's often not the most important variable in determining foreign policy. So um, I think that the evidence um, pointing to systematic repression of Uyghurs is undeniable. Um, and so I think the United States response is, is responding to the data, to the evidence, the stories. Um, and and that, that's, that's, that's what's driving that. Um, you know, understandably, China is the, the biggest power in the Asia Pacific region and has direct impact on many countries throughout the Asia Pacific, Middle East and Africa. And so all of these countries have to be mindful of that when they're deciding how they are going to speak out, if at all, against China's human rights abuses. Um, the last several years under our former prior our president was not a time of um, you know, the United States and other countries, other democracies really uh, promoting human rights at the international level. So I think the fact that less populous or, or countries with less economic power, the fact that they did not hold, hold that water on that is not surprising. But I do think in 2021, and I strongly believe this under the Biden administration, that there is a genuine and emphatic commitment to prioritizing human rights, both in China and elsewhere around the world. So I do think that there is a new opportunity for all countries of the world to unite in uh, banding together and, and making clear that China's atrocities against the Uyghurs and other Turkic Muslims has to stop. We have a question specifically, unless most of you want to add something to Joanne's answer. No, I'm just um, very, it, it's a shame that most of the Middle Eastern countries, or I should say most, all of them actually, are keeping silent on where Uyghur atrocities and yeah, I know, and we all know that it's because of a strong economic tie with China. But again, it's also very disappointing that Muslim Ummah also they are not really speaking. And some of them are showing support uh, to the, for the Chinese government for what they have been doing in the region. Um, I'm, a, I'm hopeful that maybe in the near future there will be a change. We have a question about Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and I'm going to add to that, Turkey. Turkey and Azerbaijan and others. Uh, what has been their response? Was, again, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Turkey, Azerbaijan. What, is, what have their responses been to the Uyghur crisis? Have they come out with any statements? How have they uh, tried to help or, or not help the Uyghur population? Uh, uh, the uh, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, or Kyrgyzstan, those are the members of APEC. So they don't really stand up uh, for the rights of the Uyghur people or Kazakhs or others. Um, but um, we do have supports from the citizens like Uzbeks and Kazakh. And also uh, Kazakhs also one of the uh, victims of this concentration camps. And some of them were able to leave China uh, under, because uh, under the agreement between China and Kazakhstan. But after they uh, they were released and they were, now they live in Kazakhstan, but they are not free to uh, uh, to speak up, and there are a lot of pressure from the Kazakh government as well. Um, Turkey has been very. I mean, we were regard Turkey as a second um, homeland. However, uh, in the recent years, we can see that Chinese and the relationship between China and uh, Turkey is getting closer and closer, 
And, and so, but the government does not really speak up again. Like last year, they showed the concern uh, about Uyghur, that is all. But they, we don't see really like uh, actions from the government. Let me, let me ask you this. The, the, I think Turkey is a very unique example in that, you know, often people say that it might have one position when it really has no position at all. For example, uh, oftentimes we hear that Turkey is an enemy or an antagonist to Iran, yet they have relations and they deal in Syria or with Russia. But yet, you know, we see that, that Turkey has made quite a few statements about the Uyghurs. Um, is there a tension or almost a forced silence in some arenas because Turkey has to get along with China or with Russia or with Iran? That the, the bilateral relations between Turkey and China almost force a different approach or a turning of the eye on some of the issues. Is that what you see with Turkey? Well, the Turkish government is there turning blind eye on the Uyghurs at the moment. But, but we are seeing a lot of support from oppositional parties like the EU party and, uh, and, uh, and some other parties uh, like uh, Dewa and Gelecek uh, parties. Uh, I'm, I'm not really a policy expert, but what I can tell you is just uh, Chinese uh, and Turkey and China are now um, the, the relationship is getting really close. And also, is, is that is that the executive position or the AKP party from China as well? Um, sorry, I missed your. Is that the AKP party or is that an executive position coming from President Erdogan himself? What what's the source of that? Because I know that the AKP party has been, you know, very vocal about the ethnic cleansing of Uyghurs, and clearly yeah. that's the. No, uh, well, in oh yeah, Europe, if you disagree, it's okay. <laughs> 2009, uh, when, when there was ethnic clash between Han Chinese and Uyghur, President Erdogan said that there is an, it is genocide. I remember it very clearly. But now his position is totally changed. And the current government is a coalition government. It is AKP and MHP, it's the Nationalist Party. Those parties used to be very supportive of Uyghurs. But now they've been so silent just because the economic relationship with China and also there are a lot of propaganda working uh, going on in Turkey as well. But uh, it's, it's a position of uh, Erdogan as, as well as the whole party, I believe. Um, it's, it's very disappointing, but we are also very hopeful that oppositional parties like uh, EE and Gelecek Dewa and other parties will well, um, we are seeing the support from them. Yeah, we have time for another question and we have one from Asif Ahmed. Has there been any effort by pro-democracy advocates in Hong Kong and Tibetan resistance to raise the issue of the Uyghurs? Does any organization or institution exist in China that advocates for the rights of the Uyghurs? Uh, Yes, we are seeing some uh, uh, efforts like by uh, like uh, uh, some people in Hong Kong and Tibet, especially the Tibetans in exile, they are showing support. And uh, like when we, um, like there was like demonstration to support the Uyghur people in Hong Kong as well. But uh, I don't know any organization or institution in China that advocates the rights of the Uyghurs. Uh, it, is, it is very challenging and risky uh, uh, thing to, Show, show your support for the Uyghurs. And I, I mean, in the, in the current uh, Communist China uh, Party, it is, it's impossible. Uh, they would be jailed, right? Uh, jail, or maybe you will forcibly disappear and we don't know where you go forever. Yeah, and those organizations and groups would be forcibly shut down. Yeah. That's, so, that's why Amnesty there, International cannot operate in China. Has, I, has there been any coalition work with you know, Tibetans with people from Hong Kong, anything like that? Is there any kind of, uh, you know, solidarity between them? Do they see this as a common struggle? Um, we had events together, like Hong Kongers, and I was on a panel. So the Hong Kongers and Taiwanese and, and also uh, Tibetans and even Mongols, Southern Mongolians, we had the event together. Uh, 
but because of pandemic, again, so most of the events are on, on virtual. Hopefully, um, once the pandemic is over, then we can get together, have meetings and conferences to show solidarity with each other. Yeah, in uh, 2019, pre-pandemic and also pre-imposition of the national security law in Hong Kong, we definitely saw Hong Kong protesters holding rallies in solidarity with China's Uyghur Muslims. Um, but as we all know, like the both the pandemic and then the new uh, draconian national security law that went into effect in Hong Kong are, have been game changers for Hong Kong. I, I wanna use my discretion as the moderator here to take the last question for myself. I, I wanna hear both of you forecast the future of the, the Uyghur crisis, the ethnic cleansing of Uyghurs, whether you see any hope for the future that this will end happily for the Uyghurs and that this might come to an end. Uh, Mustafa, why don't you start? Um, so let's just represent my own opinion, does not represent my organization, just make it clear. I'm very pessimistic. And what's going, what's happening in the region is very concerning. As we know, like while Uyghur children were sent to the orphanage and Uyghur men were sent to the labor, uh, labor camps or concentration camps and Uyghur women are forcefully sterilized. And our language is, and, and culture being crushed by the Chinese government. So, and the new generation of Uyghurs, they are not even capable of speaking Uyghur. And if you cannot keep your language, how can you keep your own identity? Um, but sometimes I'm, I try to encourage myself, well, main population of Uyghurs are farmers. So farmers are, you know, uh, if you look at the history, they always carry the culture and the language and pass it to the next generation. But when I look at this under this in 21st century, especially under the Chinese regime, it's very hard. I mean, we don't, I don't, we don't want, at least I don't want my people become the they, uh, they disappear, um, but unless there's like a regime change or enough pressure from international communities and countries, there will not be any huge development or changes in Uyghur's uh, situation. Thank you, Mr. Ba. Joanne, uh, I see you're playing a video or, <laughs> or a PowerPoint. Yeah, um, I mean, what Mustafa just shared with us is very grave and that we're not just talking about untold numbers of people who've been killed and a million people plus who've been detained. We're talking about a people, a culture that is at risk of being extinguished. And so time is of the essence every single day. I will say that of all the cases that Amnesty, Amnesty International has researched and documented, and these are the cases where people in the diaspora are taking tremendous risks to speak out. And mo all of them actually have had no contact with their families in Xinjiang. They don't know if their family members are alive, if they're detained, if they're jailed. Um, and so the situation there is very dire. I do think the place where there is some, some, some modicum for hope is exactly what, what Mustafa said. I do think there is growing global education and attention to the situation in Xinjiang. You know, the fact that we have governments around the world condemning Chinese authorities, that this has risen to be one of the top human crises, human rights crises facing the world. The fact that, you know, international um, apparel companies are feeling the heat and um, having to make adjustments in their business practices, this is all movement in the right direction. Um, this is also one of the issues where uh, law lawmakers in the United States on both sides of the aisle are working to let together collaborative collaboratively and productively. So while I wouldn't call that a reason for hope, I do think that it points to an opportunity and how we absolutely have to lean in and make the most of this opportunity. Because if we don't, the situation in Xinjiang will continue without end. And that is something that we just cannot allow. Thank you, Joanne. And just one last question before I thank you both for participating today in the audience. Uh, 
here in Washington, D.C., there are many organizations, both private and governmental, that uh, are involved in protecting freedom of religion worldwide. It's part of our role in the world as America that whether Muslims are oppressed in Xinjiang or whether uh, Iranians are, are oppressed by their government or Christians are oppressed or Yazidis or wherever they may be, where, where somebody's being oppressed because of their religion, there are organizations here in Washington that will address that. And I wonder how, what has their role been and how involved have they been in the Uyghur crisis, the Uyghur ethnic cleansing? Um, the international religious uh, freedom community has been very involved in um, drawing attention to the plight of the Uyghurs. And this has been going on for many years, which is in part why I think there has been a bipartisan, growing bipartisan interest. Um, so there are what, groups and individuals what, 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 which we would you know, dub conservative in American political terms that are very engaged on this issue, as well as people, you know, who are progressives on the other side of the political spectrum. Um, the, the Chinese government, um, you know, as Mustafa says, you know, it persecutes all religions, whether they're Muslim Uyghurs, Christians who have to worship underground, the Falun Gong that's been imprisoned for their religion. So um, Absolutely, the freedoms that we have in the United States, in fact, the very first freedom in our first amendment of the United States is, 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 a, is not a freedom recognized in China and is not enjoyed by anyone in China. So I think that uh, that understanding has been a unifying uh, force and has, it has been a way to bring in um, many people from the international religious freedom community. And we think they have a vital role to play both in the United States and at the international level in bringing an end to this crackdown on the Uyghurs. And Mustafa, have you been very involved in, in participating with them? Uh, not really, um, but we are, I know and I'm aware that we are getting enough support from them and they're concerned about Uyghurs and they also want to have some events in the future. Uh, yeah, that's why I know. Well, we're, we are out of time for today, but I just want to thank our audience and thank our panelists and the National Interest Foundation. And of course, the executive director of the National Interest Foundation, Khaled Safuri, for hosting this event today. The Uyghur uh, ethnic cleansing is, is a crime of immense magnitude that we should all be aware of and all try to bring to a stop. Certainly there are human rights violations occurring worldwide in many countries today. Russia promotes them throughout the world. And actually I think uh, many of us see this as a, as a huge problem for Russia, China, elsewhere. And I think that uh, all of us can empathize with the Uyghur community and hope that certainly no one in America is doing anything that is subsidizing or assisting in this ethnic cleansing. And then if they are, it'll come to an end. Thank you both. Thank you to the audience. Have a nice day. Thank you.